<laughs> okay, we're going to try T. We're going to see if T can keep me going. No. I have a hard time teaching in the afternoon. And so the problem is, you think they ask for your course request in like week one of the semester. So last semester, when I was trying the afternoon for the first time, I was like, it'll be fine. And it really sucked all semester. And so now here I am again. And so I'm trying all sorts of sugar stimulant um, combinations. Well, mostly caffeine being stimulant. But um, it would be inappropriate otherwise. More efficient? No, I'm just kidding. I'm being recorded. OK, so um, business. Um, so I usually start every class with a business slide and just go over this stuff and then there'll usually be a slide that's like so far and it's a little recap of everything we've done so far. We haven't done much so that recap slide's going to be like teeny tiny. But um, that recap slide could be a good study guide because I always kind of list the topics that we've, that we've covered so far. Anyways. So um, hopefully everyone received notification as to whether or not you are going to be able to get into this class. Please see me if you haven't. I basically went through all the wait lists and cross-checked with the people who came on <coughs> Tuesday and let in whoever I could with the preference being people who are trying to graduate first. Um, so check your email. If you weren't on the wait list, then you were really low because I took the people on the wait list first. Um, okay, you have until 5 p.m. Friday to complete the pretest. Reminder: um, Quiz one is going to open up Friday afternoon by 5 p.m. I always have it open by 5. If I miss it by 5, I usually give you an extra day to finish it. So, um, and it'll close 11:59 p.m. on Sunday. So you might want to stop. I'm going to give you all one minute right now to put a reminder in your phone to take the quiz, because people really, that, is that your reminder to take the quiz? But maybe, maybe you set that up right now, because people have really forgotten early on because they're not used to it, and then it hurts them. So everyone take a minute, set a reminder in your phone. If you're a reminder in the phone, take a person. If you're not, you know, have your pet pigeon bring you a gift at 5 p.m. I don't know how people remember things. Put a rubber band around your finger, whatever. But just put it in there and remember. Okay. Oh, planner, paper and pen. Paper and pen. Good. Sorry, the digital age. I forgot right. about paper. Okay. Um, recitation begins next week. Uh, papers are up at least for the next few weeks. Um, please don't go and be overzealous and print out all the papers that are available, because sometimes I might change something. So just try to stay on top of the upcoming week in case I do change something. Um, read your papers before recitation, otherwise you're wasting your time, and you'll be bored and frustrated if you don't know what's going on. I always post discussion questions. Those usually are a little bit more last minute because I'm trying to get them done Sunday night or something like that. Luckily, recitations don't start till Tuesday, so it shouldn't be too last minute. But always check to make sure you have your papers that are read and your discussion questions printed. You do not need to actually answer them until you get to class. You're going to do that with your, your group. Um, OK, so that's our business at the moment. OK, last time we didn't do much of anything. Uh, we talked. We started talking about the concept of a cell as part of a larger organism, and that how it needs to respond to the environment, right? And so that's kind of where we're going to pick up a little bit. Uh, but let's just take a quick minute, and we're going to talk about our genome because this is molecular biology. So we should take a minute to talk about our genome. Um, we'll probably take most of the semester to talk about our genome, but here we'll just take a minute. Okay. So what is a genome? <coughs> DNA. Okay. That's right. Does anyone want to add to that? When I say genome, what do you think of? You just think of DNA? Genetic makeup. Your genetic makeup. What else? 
how it's annotated? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So all your genes are annotated to be certain, have a certain function, right? What else? That's good. Are you there? Huh? Are you there? Base pairs, okay, they're made up of DNA base pairs, yep. Any other things come to mind? <coughs> That's pretty good, okay. So, what is contained? Okay, so we've got our genome, it's our DNA. What, what does our genome contain? Information. Information. Oh, well, that's specific, yes. So, so we're ta that's talking about structure of DNA. Yeah, but what is, like, what's the content of our genome? Other than DNA <coughs> and base pairs and phosphate groups and sugars. Yep. Huh? Okay. Um, histones. Okay, so that's the structure. Our DNA is wound around histones. But let's say we have take all our DNA and we look at it, and we're saying, what's in that DNA? What is <coughs> that DNA? What information is there? Yeah. Most of the sequence. Okay, sequences. So those sequences, I'm trying to get there. Yes? There's instructions for my genes and not for your body. Instructions for your body. Okay, you're taking me in a direction I want to be going in. Instructions to make proteins. Is your whole genome instructions to make proteins? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Information that helps you get through life. So those would be the proteins that you're going to make that's going to help you to the characteristics, traits. Okay, so, so you've got all these genes that code for proteins that are involved in how you look and how you act and how you respond to the environment and all that. So how much of your genome do you think is responsible for everything we just talked about? Very little. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so that's one thing we're going to talk about, is that most of your genome is not protein coding. A really small percentage, like less than 4%. Um, and so then the other thing to think about is um, genome size, right? So <laughs> does the size of an organism's mm -hmm. genome correlate with the organism complexity? No. No, okay. So, right, so this is just a nice um, chart showing genome size. So here we are, these mammals, archaea, really small, you'd expect. Lungfish, gigantic. Um, and so um, this is your lungfish. Um, and their genome is 132.8 billion base pairs, and ours is only 3.5 billion base pairs. Would you say that we're more complex? So the real question is, um, well, the real question is, what makes us more complex, right? So you uh, you might say, well, we well we make more proteins. We make more proteins. Is that true? No, because um, um, Trichomonas vaginalis has 160 million base pair genome. And 60,000 60, protein coding genes. We only have about 20 to 25,000 um, protein coding genes. So we don't have that many protein coding genes, yet we're a more complex organism. So what's that? So what's going on in our whole genome, and why are we so complex, and what's controlling that? And well, first let's just take a look at this. So like we said, we've only got, oh, 1.5% one of our genome is protein coding, first of all. So that's teeny tiny. So there is a lot more going on, and that does contribute to our complexity. For example, you've got all these transposons in there, and these signs, and these lines, and then there's all these um, introns, which is, all right, do introns do anything? Second guess, though. Do they code for proteins? No. no. But they often have sequence in them that helps to control expression of genes. So then there's all this control of gene expression going on. And then there's the, um, well, 
So, so that's one thing. So what I'm trying to lead you towards is regulation of gene expression. That's really what makes <coughs> us more complex. Okay? And so it's not due to having a huge genome, and it's not due to having tons of proteins. It's actually due to how our genes are regulated. That's what makes us so complex. Um, and then, of course, the way we regulate our genes does have an effect on the number of functional proteins produced. And I don't say, I'm not saying the number of proteins, I'm saying the number of functional proteins, meaning one protein might have many different functions depending on how it's modified. So let's just move a little bit deeper into this, okay? So one transcriptional unit, so one gene, right? Transcriptional unit meaning has a promoter, has a start code on, has a stop code on. One transcriptional unit can produce many different proteins that can function in many different ways. Did you know that? <coughs> Raise your hand if you knew that. Awesome. Okay, so then we can go. Um, so most of you who took 408 with me know this because I kind of harp on this a little bit. But um, the real question is how, right? You've got 500,000 plus proteins produced from 20,000 protein coding, protein coding genes. So you've got one gene producing many more functional proteins. How? Like, what, what's the mechanism behind this? Yep. Okay, so one thing is post-translational modification. So how protein is modified is going to affect its function. Yep. Alternative splicing, right? So if you have one RNA and it's spliced different ways, it's going to make a different protein. What else? You guys are all 408 people. <laughs> it's like I planted you in the audience. I'm sorry. The audience. It's like there's an audience. Um, RNA editing, right? So that's changing, um, that's editing the RNA sometimes to create premature stop codons. So those are some big ones, right? So alternative splicing, right? And we're going to learn about splicing in great detail further on in the semester. But alternative splicing is just recognition of different splice sites that result in different mRNAs, which result in different proteins. RNA editing, an example, my favorite example, because I used to work on a related gene, is um, our cytodine deaminases. They deaminate cytidines, so you end up with a uracil. And so with the apo apoprotein B gene, one of the codons is um, edited. Or what, um, yeah, one of the codons is edited. So you have um, C CAA, so this cytidine is changed to a uracil, which makes it a stop codon in the middle of the gene. So you end up with two very different types of proteins with different functions. So that's one gene. It's edited, results in two different proteins. Okay? So all of these things make us much more complex, right? We can get so many more functional proteins. Remember, it's the proteins that are doing the work, right? No, I'm really protein-centric. RNA, we have to give RNA a lot of credit. Because RNA does a lot of work, too. Um, and then post-translational modifications, if you modify your resulting protein, either through some sort of proteolytic processing or um, um, by degrading it, or by modifying it so it changes the interaction with a different protein. So a protein can be phosphorylated, right? That's a post -trans Give me, actually, let me ask you guys. Give me some post-translational modifications. I just had phosphorylation. Yep. Methylation? Protein? Yeah. Well, maybe. We have to look in. I don't want to say absolutely not, but I always think of DNA. Um, no, protein. Yep. Glycosylation. Glycosylation? Yep. Ubiquitination? Yep. All the Asians? Anything else? 
How about from this side of the room? I was ignoring you guys. Let's come over here. Then I try to come over here more. I try to stay near the computer so can record me. Yep. Oh, you can have ions. Yeah, but those often, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not really post-translational modification, but it is something that's happening to the protein that is modifying its function, for sure. Structure, quite a bit. Okay, I can think of that. What else? Anyone over here? Sumo? Simulation? There's a lot out there. ISG elation? There's a lot. So usually what these things are doing, so for example, with phosphorylation, you're changing the shape of the protein so that it can interact or not interact with its binding partner that's required for its function. So when you think about signal transduction and there's all this phosphorylation happening, usually what's happening is you're either saying, okay, now you, you're saying to the other protein, now you can interact with me, or now you can't interact with me. And that either allows signaling to happen or turns it off. <coughs> Um, and a lot of these can be, are, are reversible. So you can have phosphorylation, you can have dephosphorylation, you can have ubiquination, you can have deubiquination. Simulation, desimulation, all of these things. So that affects protein function quite a bit. Okay, so the way to think about the cell and how it functions can be pretty much summed up in one slide. This right here is cell and molecular biology in one slide, not really, but it's a lot of what we're going to be thinking about in one slide. So you can think of it as the workflow of the cell, right? So there'll be a cell and it'll get a signal somehow from either from another cell or from itself, which might be something binding to a receptor, maybe. And it's going to have some kind of effect on gene expression, either positive or negative, right? So if it's got a negative effect, you'll get these chromatin modifications that will result in gene expression being off, right? And then that's that. If it's a positive effect, then you're going to get chromatin remodeling, which we're going to start talking about next week. Um, recruitment of RNA polymerase by transcription factors, then transcription, then RNA processing, maturation, export from the nucleus, translation. Then you might get modification of that protein with a small protein and molecule, depending on the function. That's all dependent on the function. And then when the protein doesn't need to do its job anymore, it's often purposefully degraded, right? What better way to turn off a process than to degrade a key player in the process? And so you can kind of think of everything in this context in this class, because we're going to be talking about chromatin structure and function, and often in how it relates to gene expression. We're going to be talking about um, Transcription factors and activation and regulation of gene expression. We're going to be talking about splicing, all of the things that um, are kind of part of this workflow. So whenever you're kind of stuck in this like detail obsessing memorization, stop and just think, okay, where is this in the whole big picture of things? Any questions? Shouldn't be right. Pretty simple. Is it going to be this simple all semester? Yeah. Come on, someone give me a nodding yes. Okay, yeah, we got it. Okay, good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so first we need to, I'm just going to go through signal transduction briefly because I really want you to understand where the signal is coming from. For those who took cell biology, is you can have a nap if you want, um, but you can also just go feel really good about knowing what I'm talking about. Um, so... Basically, the, the main concept is this, just that you have some signaling molecule binding to a receptor, and there's all these different proteins that are binding to each other and activating each other that result in a transcription factor that goes into the nucleus and activates gene expression, right? So you can think of your generic signaling pathway where you've got your signaling molecule, and the whole purpose really is just facilitating cell-cell communication. Um, and you're relaying the message from the outside of the cell to the nucleus. And so you've got a signaling molecule binding to a receptor, and then a whole bunch of proteins that are going to activate each other or phosphorylate each other or interact with each other in some sort of way, with the end result being um, liberating 
somehow liberating a transcription factor and allowing it to go to the nucleus. Um, and then the end result is often gene expression, but sometimes also set of skeleton reorganization. And so this is also very much involved in cancer um, when things go wrong. So if signaling is highly regulated, let's say some kind of signaling pathway that's going to result in cell growth. That's the most obvious one. And if it's really tightly regulated and then there's a mutation in one of the proteins involved in the regulation, losing the regulation, and then you have uncontrolled cell growth. So when things go wrong in signaling, you get usually high levels of gene expression associated with cell growth. Okay, so I'm going to go through two examples of my favorite signal transduction pathways. Um, and these are both usually um, resulting from some kind of extracellular signal coming from another cell, sometimes from the same cell. So the JAK-STAT pathway, do not memorize this pathway. Don't memorize any pathways because it's not useful. Um, so um, when you're infected with a virus, often one thing that will happen is interferons will be produced and secreted by infected cells. And so those interferons are being secreted from the infected cell, and they're going to bind to a receptor on, on another cell and activate the JAK-STAT pathway. And so you get all this phosphorylation and activation and whatever, with the end result being um, STAT1 and STAT2 are going to dimerize, and they form a transcription factor that can enter the nucleus and they'll bind to some other regulatory proteins, and they bind to an enhancer region upstream from the start site of the gene and activate gene expression. Is it one gene that's being activated? No, it's often many genes. Um, in this case, there's an alpha interferon response element in the DNA, and they're all over the place before all the genes that need to be turned on in response to interferon. And so you get expression of that group of genes. Um, my other favorite pathway is the nf kappa b pathway. And here you'll have TNF-alpha, which again is, is a signaling molecule that's being secreted by another cell, and it's going to bind to a receptor. And then you'll get activation of all these signaling molecules, which in the end are going to result in phosphorylation of an inhibitor protein called i kappa b And that inhibitor protein is actually hiding the nuclear localization signal of the transcription factor. So normally inhibitors binding, hiding nuclear localization signal, it's stuck in the cytoplasm. Can you activate gene expression if you're in the cytoplasm? No. Why? Because you need to actually go and physically bind to your to the DNA, right? So that's how gene expression is off. <laughs> when signaling happens, I kappa B is phosphorylated and degraded, purposefully degraded, um, and NF kappa B can enter the nucleus, bind to the DNA, activate gene expression. And again, you've got this, these NF kappa B binding sites all over your genome, um, directly upstream from genes that are involved in the immune response. Okay, um, I, they, there are these companies. I used to do a project in this class, which I don't. I'm not doing this semester. I'm slightly sad about it, but you guys should probably be really relieved, actually. Um, <coughs> where I would give um, gene expression data out to everyone, and you guys would have to look at gene expression patterns in response to virus virus infection and choose genes that you think are interesting to focus on and write a proposal. And it was a really cool project, um, but there's too many of you now, and I think my head would explode, because I had to actually keep track of everyone's projects and make sure they were logical. But it was the nf kappa b pathway, and um, I would give you guys, it was like something like 75 genes that are affected by nf kappa b So when you're thinking about gene expression and transcription factors, often one transcription factor 
will activate a number of different genes. And it's not just one transcription factor activates one gene, it's a combination. And we'll, talk, we'll learn about that. Okay, so what's the big picture here? Why are you talking about this? I just, I'm going to just really try to, I'm really trying to drill into your heads that gene expression is, re, is occurring in response to the environment. I feel like when I took molecular biology, I was just like, what's all this about proteins and a promoter? And I don't get it. Like, I felt like that. I remember feeling really confused as to the context of all the stuff I was learning. And so I really try to start the class with you understanding that genes or gene expression is being activated or repressed or whatever, usually in response to the environment. Okay? Remember, cells need to respond to the environment that they're in. Um, so signaling molecules, they're, they're going to be secreted by cells, and they're basically transmitting information from cell to cell. And they result in a transcription factor entering the nucleus and activating gene expression, and then also um, cytoskeletal reorganization, which you learned about it by 408, I should have said 408. Um, why is this transcription factor entering the nucleus? What does it do? It's binding to DNA and activating gene expression. Okay, any questions about the stuff that I'm talking about? All really basic and clear. You guys ready for the exam? What if I just randomly gave exams in the middle? Like, okay. Let's do it. Wouldn't that be awesome? You'd never know what to expect. I'm trying a chai. It's a chai tea. Yeah, but it's like truly like it's not like the like super milky sugary kind, which I think it would be better if it was the super milky sugary kind. Yes. <laughs> Signaling possibilities of carbohydrates. Okay, so lots. So are you thinking about the fact that a lot of a lot of the proteins that end up on the plasma membrane are highly glycosylated? Okay. Um, and why are they glycosylated? Is that what really what you're asking? So there's two things, right? There's two parts of the equation. One is the signaling molecule that's going to be secreted out of the cell, and the other is the receptor that's going to be bound, right, by the signaling molecule. And the receptors, yes, are highly glycosylated. Um, that's, they always are. Uh, <laughs> so it must work well. Um, the signaling, I wouldn't say that the glycosylation actually does much in terms of the signaling as much as it more has to do with um, you know, I got this question last semester when I was teaching about this and I answered it better than I'm about to. Um, more has to do with space. Let me get back to you on the exact exact reasoning. I know it has to do with um, immune responses. Let me get back to you on that. You know what? No. Can we get back to you? Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I was just about to say, you're totally trying to do a stump the teacher. Were you planted by Venus over here? Okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to start the semester on day two with the stump the teacher of something I totally know, but I just can't think of a good answer for right now, um, which is um, what is the function of glycosylation on receptors? Is that really your question? Kind of. Huh? It'll do. Wait, no, no, no. <laughs> but I want to make sure we're really going to get to it. Because you're talking about all these carbohydrates and signaling, right? One more time. The function of glycosylation on a receptor. This is a bio 408 question. <laughs> 
Okay, you guys have 24 hours. 24 hours to email me a reference answer. This is worth a point. Extra credit on the second day of the class. For okay. What about more than one person email? Everyone who gets it gets it. Um, yes, everyone who gets me a fully referenced, referenced, clear, correct answer gets one point. On Blackboard, there will be a column in Grade Center that says cumulative extra credit. You will always be able to check there to see if you got the extra credit. Or email me. Um, everyone will always get it if it's correct. Don't tell me what you think or what would you feel. I want data. Okay. No, you can't. The question for the last time is, what was the... So the question was about um, signaling and all the carbohydrates that are added to receptors. And what is the purpose of white population and its effect on signaling? I really think it's just the signaling molecule binds to the receptor. That's neither here nor there. But what's the purpose of white population? because it's embarrassing that I can't answer that very well right now. Okay, this is what happens. You guys benefit. Okay, now I have my eye on you in the back. What's your name again? No, no. Troublemaker. <laughs> Jeffrey. Okay, so we can thank Jeffrey for his, for the point that you guys are all about together. <coughs> okay. Transcription. Well, well, we kind of talked a little bit about, the, about this the other day, but um, we'll go a little deeper. So what is transcription? See an expression or hear someone say, what is, um, what is it? If you were to Google it, which you're not doing right now, what it would Google tell you? Yes? DNA RNA. DNA RNA, exactly. So when does it happen? Yep. When an RNA polymerase uh, replicates, becomes a strand of DNA. When an RNA polymerase replicates, do you want to say replicates? Yeah. But I know where you're going. When RNA polymerase binds to antigens derived um, from the from from the DNA. Okay. What? Um, but let's get more specific. When temporally? What? When in time? Yeah. Does transcription happen? Okay, so when the, when the cell gets a signal that it needs to do what? To transcribe what? The whole genome? A certain certain genes, like the coding region of a certain what? So when it when it gets a signal that it needs to, to transcribe certain genes, right? It's not the whole genome, it's whatever gene it needs, the cell needs, right? So how is this regulated? Yep. Are these, is it regulated by transcription factors? Is it regulated by transcription factors? Yes, how? So how, so, um, so I asked these really vague open because I'm just trying to make you guys think, but you'll get used to it. Yes. Okay, so activation of a transcription factor, right? So how is it regulated? Well, a transcription factor needs to get activated, but what does that mean? Like, how, so we have transcription factors active and we have transcription. Yep. It needs to enter the nucleus, absolutely. Right, so it's regulated by the availability of a transcription factor in the nucleus. Right, that's one thing. And what's the other thing? Binding to the DNA. So the transcription factor needs to bind to the DNA. So if your DNA is, if your chromatin is super tightly condensed and there is no access to the transcription factor binding site, then are you going to get gene expression? No, right. 
Okay, so two sides to the regulation. One has to do with permit and structure, other one has to do with availability of a transcription buffer. Okay, so what is the outcome? Gene expression. <coughs> what happens after transcription? Translation, right? So you have protein, you have um, RNA, maturation, export, and translation. Okay. So give me an example of an event that would result in transcription. Anything. Yeah. Okay, a cut. What might what kind of genes do you think might be transcribed in response to a cut? Apoptosis genes? Maybe. Maybe. What else do you think? So inflammatory response, right? So um <coughs> So you said neutrophils, macrophages. So, so to think about that, so that means recruiting neutrophils and macrophages to the area, which means those cells would meet, need to secrete some signaling molecules, chemokines, which are going to say, come here, neutrophils and macrophages. Right? So they secrete all these chemokines, and then the, the neutrophils and macrophages have receptors, and can bind to them, can move towards them. Right? Right, kind of. Give me another example of an event that would result in transcription. Only cuts? Yep. Hormones. Hormones. Right. Okay, exactly. Hormones, what do hormones bind to? Receptors. Receptors. <laughs> yeah. So they, they bind to their, their the steroid hormone receptors, the nuclear receptors, their um, growth hormone receptors, right? Hormone binds to receptors. They also, if it's a nuclear receptor, changes its conformation and directly binds to the DNA and activates gene expression. And if it's a cell surface receptor, it will also turn on a signal cascade. If it's a growth hormone, what, do you, what kind of genes do you think will be transcribed? Huh? Um, any kind of growth. What kind of genes do you think, when a cell is growing, what kind of genes do you think are involved? Cell division, like cyclins, things like that? Okay. It's okay. We're good. Okay. I was trying to, I, got, I like to push you guys to make you guys connect lots of things. We'll get there. Okay. Right. So you're evaluating the response of B cells to the presence of bacteria. What kind of genes do you expect to be transcribed in the presence of bacteria? So it's kind of like what we were just talking about with your cut example. You kind of got to it before I did. And yeah, you're going to get, um, you're gonna get um, all sorts of genes associated with recruiting immune cells into the area. You'll get genes associated with making antibodies, right? Mostly cytokines. Okay. So we're talking about gene expression. We're getting to the point that gene, gene expression occurs in response to something, not just randomly. So how do we study gene expression? So I'm going to go through four different, there's more ways, but I'm going through four common ways to study gene expression. And we're going to go from old to new, maybe? Northern blots are old school. No one does northern blots anymore, but I'm going to teach it to you anyways. Um, microarrays, reporter assays, and quantitative real-time PCR. Okay, so we'll start with old school northern blots. The reason no one does northern blots anymore because you need to know a lot of information to, to get it to work. Because basically what you're doing is you, you need to know what gene you're looking for and then it's not very quantitative. It's either it's there or it's not. So you'll have your you'll have your RNA that you extract from your cells, and let's say you're trying to look for the gene for beta actin. I don't know why you'd be looking for that, but let's say you're looking for beta actin because it's everywhere. And you actually run, you actually make a probe to that gene. So you would have a sequence. Um, some kind of nucleotide sequence that corresponds to the gene you're looking for, in this case beta actin. 
you run all your RNA from the cell. So total RNA from the cell gets run on a gel. And then you identify, you, you probe for your gene of interest with this probe you make, which is usually radioactive. Another reason no one uses it. No one likes to work with radioactivity. Who likes to work with radioactivity? No, oh, I've got some. Some of them love radioactivity. I actually usually use P32, which is really a bad one. So no one really does that anymore. I have a link for a video that you guys can watch if you want to see a little bit more about it. Um, but basically, you really need to know what you're looking for because you have to design your probe. And it's not quantitative. If anything, you're going to get a big fat band or not so fat band, but it's not truly quantitative. Um, these days, you can. there are ways to use fluorescence instead of radioactivity. Um, but there are better ways to look at gene expression now. But basically, it's just about, it's kind of like doing a Western blot. You can think of it, a Western blot, you've got protein and an antibody that's recognizing it. So you load all the proteins from the cell on your gel, transfer it to a membrane, and use an antibody specific for that protein to find it. Is it there, is it not? And you get a band if it's there. You don't get a band if it's not. In this case, you're running all the RNA on the gel, transferring it to a membrane, and you're using a probe that's anti-sense to your RNA, and it's going to bind or it's not, and it's radioactive, so it's going to make, make a band. So you might say to me, okay, well, what kinds of questions can we answer with a northern blood? So um, I'm getting tired of talking, so we'll take a break in a minute for you guys to talk about this. But I'll walk you through it for a second. Okay, so basically, anything that requires detection of a specific RNA can be answered with an order plot. Okay? So, for example, you're working in a lab, you're studying a virus, we'll call it virus X. There is no virus X, just so you know. Um, and in cells that are infected with virus X, you notice that the cellular protein, protein A, is not expressed. It's just not there. It goes away. Every time you do a Western, you look for protein A in infected cells, there's no protein A. So the graduate student that you are, I just made you all graduate students. The graduate student that you are, you're sitting and you're thinking, why is there no protein A? What is the virus doing to make protein A go away? And you come up with a list of reasons. And so you decide, I'm going to run a northern and look at the RNA and see what I can learn. And so you run, so you run all your RNA from, so you take your cells that are infected. Of course, you would have controls too, but we're not going to talk about that now. You take your infected cells and you separate your nuclear and your cytoplasmic fractions. You can actually do this. And you run all your RNA from your nuclear fraction, and then you run all your RNA from your cytoplasmic fraction, and you probe for the, the RNA for protein A. And this is what you get. So I want you guys to take a minute, discuss this with your neighbor. I want two things. One. I want you to come up with three hypotheses as to why protein A is not there. What might the virus be doing? And don't tell me it's making it go away, because we know that. I want mechanism, okay? I want you to think like scientists. And I'll circulate and clarify for those of you who don't know what the, what the question is, because sometimes people really just don't even know what I'm asking because I talk in my language, maybe not in your language. So I'll come around and clarify for those who need help. But I want to know three possibilities and how this experiment is helping to eliminate two of those possibilities. Okay? Okay. Talk to your friends, and I'll come around and answer questions. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, guys. You guys are so engaged. That's awesome. Okay. Um, I heard so many interesting hypotheses. And the main thing I heard are two things. One thing is people are getting really obsessed with the mechanism that the virus is doing this specifically. The virus might be doing something. Don't get, don't, I use viruses as examples all the time because they do manipulate things. But what I want you to try to start to train your mind to do is think very big picture. Very big picture. So the virus might be doing this and causing a frame shift and causing this whole thing. But the, 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 the outcome, no protein. So somehow inhibiting, you know. So I want you to think to yourself of like, Mechanism. One might be the protein is being degraded, right? That would be one. But so let's let's go through it, and I'm going to take answers. And I, I put up three, but there could be an infinite number of possibilities, because I'm hearing some that I didn't even think of that are very possible. Um, so um, raise your hand if you want to share a hypothesis. Yep. Um, in some way, the virus or one of the particles Okay, well, uh, <laughs> you went to the top of the pathway. Yeah, okay, so um, you're saying somehow an attachment, the virus is preventing normal signaling through that receptor. Okay, so let's get, you know, that's really specific. And if you are working on a virus, it might be, if you know something about that, that might be the direction you want to go. The outcome should be, so what's, if so, what we're looking at here is, is RNA, um, but the outcome of no, the earliest outcome of no signaling should be no RNA or no protein? No RNA. No RNA. Okay. So, an easier way to say it is the virus is somehow inhibiting transcription. Great. Okay. So, that's one. Yeah. The RNA splicing. Okay. So, that's talking about maturation. So the RNA is somehow inhibiting RNA maturation, splicing, polyadenylation, capping. Um, and so when you inhibit splicing or maturation, um, where is that RNA normally found in the cell? Nucleus or cytoplasm? Nucleus, right? Because you can't get out of the nucleus if you're not if you're not processing. Okay, who who else has one? Yep. RNA silencing. Okay, so RNAi, usually that, that those are these small interfering RNAs that will bind to and cause degradation of specific mRNAs or cause um, inhibition of translation of specific RNAs. Okay, so what's the outcome of that? No RNA or no protein or both? No protein and? Well, it depends. Maybe no RNA if it's degrading the RNA. Um, and is that happening in the nucleus or cytoplasm? Cytoplasm. Cytoplasm. Because I believe all the machinery is cytoplasm for RNA. But I'm not, I, you know, whatever. Okay, so that's one. So we're seeing inhibition of transcription. That was one. We're hearing. Inhibition of uh, maturation, which you would see no RNA in the cytoplasm, only RNA in the nucleus. I'm hearing RNAi, which should result in RNA in the nucleus, no RNA in the cytoplasm. Well, did anyone have any ideas? Yep. Misfolding. So something's happening which is resulting in protein misfolding. What's the outcome of misfolded protein? Degradation, so that would also cause the protein to be gone. Great. Yep. If proteins are living for longer rather than being degraded, you have fewer amino acids in presence, so you can't really manufacture. Oh, wow. 
Um, so I'm hearing extending the life of total proteins resulting in a lack of amino acids present in the cell, resulting in no more protein being made. Whew. That, I don't even know how I would test for that, but it's feasible. <laughs> You know, there's no wrong answer. It's just, is there a feasible answer and can it be tested for? Yep. Um, mRNA is being alternatively spliced. Oh, the mRNA is being alternatively spliced, and that is resulting in a protein, A, not being made, right, because it would be different protein. So how would that look on a northern? Would you see your RNA in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm? Or nowhere? Well, so splicing happens after transcription, but before going out to cytoplasm. So you definitely wouldn't see it in cytoplasm. You might see it in the nucleus, depending on your timing. Yeah? A deletion mutation occurring in the RNA. It would delete the nucleotides for the sequence of the protein. So. Okay, so if there's some sort of deletion, again, affecting protein. protein. Um, yeah, that's hard for me because deletions often come from genomic, like they're not coming from a, a virus, for example, or a drug treatment. Um, but Something that's affecting the RNA would affect the protein. Okay, yep. The virus is affecting something associated with the translation process. You've got plenty of RNA out there, but you can transfer it. Okay, so virus is inhibiting translation. Okay, that's very possible. In that case, if you ran a northern, would you expect to see RNA nuclear and cytoplasmic? It's getting that far. Yep. It's getting that far, why not? Right, right. Okay, so you guys are having some really great ideas. I love it, I love it. Um, so the reason I put the Northern is I was like, well, you know, so some of these hypotheses can actually be answered by running a Northern and looking at your nuclear and cytoplasmic fractions of RNA because you'll know if something is being being inhibited. You know if translation is being inhibited, right? Because should you see anything if, not translation, transcription is being inhibited. Should you see anything if transcription is being inhibited? You should see zero bands in either one, right? Because you have transcription happening in the nucleus, so you'll get a larger RNA in the nucleus, which is why it's larger. Then you have the maturation, and then your mRNA is being exported into the cytoplasm, which is why it's smaller, right? You see both of those. So likely, transcription is not being inhibited, right? Can we all agree on that? Okay. So based on this data, what do you think might be happening? Or what do you think, what, what, or what hypothesis can you cancel that? <coughs> Transcription, I just said. What's another one that can be canceled out? Translation. So, interference with receptors, anything, because you are still getting transcription. Yeah, what else can you Splicing. Splicing. So, yeah, you're, it's definitely not affecting splicing because you're still getting export to the cytoplasm. What else? Can you say anything about protein? Not really, right? You know it's gone. So, so based on this data, I would say the RNA is not being affected at all, and it's likely translation or protein stability, right? And we would have to do a different experiment to do that. So usually you do one experiment, you cross off some hypotheses, and then you do another one, you cross off some or make more, <laughs> and then that's, that's how science goes. Any questions about this? Yeah. Can you tell me again how you knew it wasn't due to splicing? So the question is, how did we know it wasn't due to splicing? Well, I haven't taught you anything about splicing yet, so it's harder to understand at this point. But splicing happens between transcription and export from the nucleus. And so unspliced RNA cannot exit the nucleus. Do we see a band in the cytoplasmic fraction? 
Yeah. And is it smaller in size? So you have to think um, the inchon was like that. Yeah. So you can, based on that, you can you can expect that to be the case. Okay. Any other questions? That's a good one. Okay. Um, good. Let's move on. Okay. That was enough with the northern, old school northern blood. Yep. So, questions like that, should we be prepared to see things like that on exams? Mm -hmm. So, the question is should we be prepared to see things like that on exams? Yes. I love questions <coughs> like that because you have to merge multiple areas of information, and that's called analytical thinking. And that's how my exam questions look, except for they're in multiple choice format, usually. So it might be like, which of the following are feasible reasons for, you know, based on the data, what, which of the following are possible explanations for the absence of protein A? And you have to look at the data and think about it, think about what you know. I wouldn't do it like I did it now without teaching you much of anything, because I'm trying to just see where you are and kind of engage you in, in the thought process. But it would be based on stuff we could just learn, at least. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk about qPCR for a few minutes. Um, so this is real-time PCR. Who's done real-time PCR? Good. <laughs> Who's done too much real-time PCR? <laughs> okay, good. Um, and who's familiar with just plain old-fashioned PCR? Okay, so just plain old-fashioned PCR is just about ampl amplification of a certain segment of DNA, right? You make your primers, and it's like a photocopy machine for DNA. You make more and more copies through this process of, um, of polymerase, DNA polymerase, just extending your primers based on your template. QPCR, the only difference is it's quantitative. So it's the same process of PCR, which I'm not going to really go over because you've learned it I don't know how many times by now. But um, the difference with QPCR is you're looking at mRNA, essentially. So what you're doing is you're isolating all of your RNA from your cell, and you're converting it into cDNA, really just because it's more stable. Why RNA versus DNA? Well, you're using it to quantify gene expression. If you amplify your DNA, are you answering any questions about gene expression? No. I'm here to pick up all things that fall. <laughs> That's one of my side jobs. Okay. Um, so, so by quantifying the amount of RNA, you can say something, so you have your untreated cells and your treated cells, and you'd look for an increase or decrease in specific RNA. And you also need to know, with this method, you need to know what you're looking for because you need to design primers that are specific to the gene of interest. Um, now there's much more cool things that you can do. People do something called RNA-seq, where they sequence all the RNA in the cell. And depending on how many reads of each RNA you get, you can say something about abundance of RNA. And there you actually don't need to know what you're looking for because it's sequencing everything, but you need to know a little bit of computer programming and bioinformatics to deal with the massive amount of data. Okay, so you're gonna do a PCR and uh, you might say to me, well, how is this quantified? Well, it's because you're using some fluorescence. So you're either using cyber green or some other fluorescence. And usually what happens is as your, as your polymerase is extending your product, it's integrating fluorescence into it. And there's a detector in the instrument, in the real-time PCR instrument, that's, that's quantifying that amount of fluorescence. And as your, <coughs> as your product increases, your fluorescence increases. And so usually you have controls and you can do calculations to figure out how much your RNA has gone up in your treated sample compared to your control. And so you get something, so it's this exponential increase in cDNA. 
as your cycles increase. So you so you'll go through these cycles of extension over and over and over again, up to about 40 cycles, and you'll get this exponential increase in in um, cDNA or in DNA, and you get something that looks like this. And this is showing on the bottom the cycle number, and this is your intensity of your fluorescence, and it relates to the abundance of your template. So if you have a very small amount of template, it's going to take a lot longer for it to get exponentially, to get into its exponential phase. You can think of it like, um, I always like to compare it to um, bacterial growth curve. Because that's something you can really understand, right? What's going on? Someone doing construction over there? You can think of it like a bacterial growth curve. If you put one bacterial cell in a culture, and you put a million bacterial cells in a culture, which one's going to grow to a high density faster? The one or the, many, the million? Right. So it's the same concept with the real-time PCR. If you've got one transcript, one mRNA of whatever gene in your cell, it's going to take a lot longer to get into this into this exponential growth. I'm so distracted. Um, it's going to take a lot longer to get into this exponential growth phase than if you start with a high amount. So things that are that are very abundant are going to come up really at a really low cycle number, and things that are, there's not that much of are going to come up at a very high cycle number. And once you go above 30, it's like you may as well have no RNA. Um, and then you do um, calculations, and you can compare and find out how much of an increase there is in your treated compared to your control. Any questions about uh, QPCR? Yes. Each of these colors is a different, um, a different well. So different. Yeah. So usually you do it in a 96 well plate. And then each of those, each well is going to have a different line. So each sample has a different amplification plot. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys can have, come to my lab. We always do real time PCR. We'll do it for you. Okay. We actually got a brand <laughs> new real time PCR machine. We're very excited. You don't have to do any math. It doesn't all for you. It's like for all you need to do is pick up. And then it gives you math. It's wonderful. Okay. Um, oh no, are we running out of time? Okay, so we'll stop now and then we'll start with QPCR. Thanks, Thanks.